first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, when I spoke to Chuck, Chuck had asked me to come in and talk about flow through shares, very specific. Um, does anybody know what flow through shares are? Okay. A few smattering of hands. Essentially, we've seen them very popular in the mining industry, particularly around junior mining companies. So junior mining companies use them as an alternative form of finance. So what are they? Do they look fancy? Do they come with a special tag? No, they're just a plain common share. That's it. The difference is they come with a special agreement that the company enters into with the shareholder. And essentially what happens is that shareholder gets to deduct or take as their own expenditures that the company makes with the money that they use, with the money that they get from issuing the share. What happens with that is that the shareholder then gets the benefit of all the deductions. So that's essentially all that it is. And there's a special rule within the Income Tax Act that allows you to do that. You can't do that with just any expenses. There are only very specific expenses that qualify for this kind of renunciation, as we call it. So you can see why they're very, very popular. Who buys them? Usually people in the top tax bracket because they get these deductions and they get to deduct them at 50%. They get to 50% uh, tax savings, essentially. 45 to 50, depending on the province that you're in. Plus, they get a bunch of tax credits. If you have a, what they call a super flow through share, you can end up with some mineral exploration tax credits. Some of the provinces also offer a bunch of tax credits. So they're very, very lucrative from an investor perspective, from a tax savings. So I won't even go into whether or not they're a good investment. I don't know. But why do the companies like them? They're giving up all their deductions. Why would they do that? Well, for a junior mining company, often what happens is it's difficult to get financing. And so this allows them an alternative form of financing. Investors know them. They're familiar with them. They're comfortable with investing in them. And hey, I get a big tax deduction in, so why not invest in them? And the, and the company doesn't need these tax deductions. It takes years to put a mine in place. You may start drilling today, and by the time you get all these expenses accumulated, by the time you'll be able to use them and you're up and taxable and running, it may be 10, 15, who knows how many years by the time you find something and you're able to actually utilize the deduction. So for them, I'd rather have the money today so that I can go out and actually continue my exploration rather than worry about the deduction. So that's why the companies like them. That's why the investors like them. They've been very popular. And they've actually been very successful. Some would argue that we would not have a diamond industry today in Canada without flow through shares. The reason for that is a company who was very small, issued flow through shares, and went up drilling in the Northwest Territories for diamonds. Happened to find them, not now, not every company afterwards issued flow through shares, but without those initial flow through shares, there wouldn't have been diamond discoveries. So what type of expenses qualify? And I think this is really important. There are several types of expenses that qualify. Canadian exploration expenditures, and the word Canadian in this case is going to be very important, has to be on national, has to be in the nation of Canada, whatever is considered within the nation of Canada. Has to be exploration expenditures. The other one is Canadian development expenditures, so putting a mine into production, some of the development costs related to that. They're not as beneficial because of the rate of deduction. I won't get into all the technical. And the last one is renewable energy. Some intangible costs around putting to, uh, wind farm up or putting in solar. Some of those intangible costs you'll see also qualify. Those are fairly limited application. We don't see nearly as many flow through shares in the renewable energy space as we do in mine. So why can't everyone use them? Company perspective. Maybe they're not incurring the right kind of expenses. Maybe they're not incurring them in Canada. If you're incurring them outside of Canada, if I'm doing a bunch of exploration in the US, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Guyana, wherever I may be doing exploration, outside of Canada, you cannot flow those, in those expenses to your shareholders. Only Canadian exploration expenditures or development expenditures. The other thing is some companies are close to getting into production. And when you get closer to production, it's easier to get financing, and you're less likely to want to give up 
your expense, your expenditures and the future deductions to somebody else. From an investor perspective, if you're in a low tax bracket or you know, not a particularly high tax bracket, it's unlikely that these are going to be enough of a bang for their buck to be able to, for you to want to invest in them, given the risk profile and your tax savings. So a lot of questions around, well, these things are great. Why can't everybody use them? Why are they not just, why are they only for the mining industry and a limited bit for the renewable energy industry? We've had experience talking to clients about why not R&D companies? Why not take technology? There's high expenditures, risk, difficult to get financing. All the risk profile that I have for a lot of the early mining companies, I have for tech companies. The reality is this. Flow through shares are not a cheap investment by the federal government. It comes with a cost. Take a deduction today for $100 that can save tax of say 25% for a company today, uh, sorry, for a company in 15 years from now, and instead an investor gets a deduction at 50% today. There's a cost. I don't get to defer my tax, and I have to give a higher tax break, if you will, to the shareholder. So what does the government get back? Because as taxpayers, I don't want to see my government giving money away. We want to have a reason for that money to be going out. And the government really sees that as an investment. Right? What did I say earlier? That basically the diamond industry that we have today, we wouldn't have without flow-through shares. So the government sees the success. They see the jobs, not just in the mine industry, just not in just the mine itself and in that community, but in all the services related to mining. We have world-class engineers here, mining engineers, that we can send around the world. We are a center of excellence for mining. And that's been created in part because of the flow through shares. We have a healthy and vibrant junior mining sector. Some would say right now it's kind of tough days for junior mining companies. I would say this is one of the first years we did not see all of the flow through share deals being fully um, subscribed for. Mining is certainly having a bit of a tough time right now, but we still see that there's a lot of potential. So, we need to see some future dividend, some future benefit to the Canadians in order to invest in flow through shares. And the reality is they are expensive. So, there is a lot of R&D. So, back to my technology example, why there was some pushback. The feeling is it would just be too expensive in that industry or around R&D in general to be able to take those expenses and flow those out. So that was, that's been the general discussions. You know, government is always open to more comments, but whenever you're approaching them, you really need to be able to demonstrate what is the benefit going to be to Canada in the future in real dollars and what kind of dividends are they going to get back? And it has to be more than the investment they're making today. What is that going to be in the future? Or else they won't really entertain. If it's just so that you can go out and make some money for yourself in the future and pay a few people and have a few jobs in your industry, that may not be enough. So that's been really sort of the, uh, the reluctance, I would say, to broaden it. The second piece I will talk about is space mining and what, how they've, what the comments have been around space mining. So the Canada Revenue Agency, which doesn't make policy, they simply apply, apply policy. So they're the auditors that will come out and check out what you're doing, check your tax return. They don't create the laws, they simply apply them when you're filing. They, uh, there was actually a technical interpretation that was written in to the Canada Revenue Agency asking them whether they felt that exploration on an asteroid, uh, whether asteroid mining and exploration would qualify for these Canadian exploration expenditures. Remember, if you don't qualify for CTE, or Canadian Exploration Expenses, you cannot renounce those through the use of flow through shares. They responded to say that no, they do not qualify. And the reason is because it is not in Canada. Okay. So unless Canada declares and goes and puts its flag up there and says oh, this asteroid is specifically <coughs> Canadian national territory, it's not going to apply based on the laws today. So if you say, well, can we change those laws? 
It goes back to my previous comment. You need to demonstrate why the cost to the government of giving those tax breaks to those shareholders today will reap benefits tomorrow. So, and changing tax laws, I will tell you, is not particularly easy. Unless it's not in your favor. <laughs> so I just given I wanted to give more of a broad overview so that if anybody has any questions, I leave it more open to questions. I have also with me a few copies of our publication that gives a, a more of a technical overview of flow through shares specific to mining. So I have a few of those, but I've also given some references to websites where you can find out some more information about flow through shares. We have at least one question. <laughs> well, two actually. First, quick one. Will the Chuck? Will the presentations be up on the website? Yes, they will be. Okay, so I don't have to write down the. <laughs> Thank you. And secondly, um, so do flow through shares? Is there some way in which they can benefit foreign investors? Something I've been wondering. They would have to Not set up to be taxable in Canada, so they can shelter the Canadian. That's uh, right. That's right. If the only way that they could get a mm -hmm. benefit is if their local tax jurisdiction, A, respected the renunciation, mm -hmm. which is unlikely. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of any jurisdiction that does. And B, that their tax system somehow allowed them to deduct whatever was renounced. I had, the only thought I had on the matter was that if a foreign company set up a Canadian subsidiary, yeah. then they could use that to collect some benefits. I wonder do people do that? <coughs> if there if there are any real benefits there. You could set it up, but I don't think there are any benefits to yeah. the foreign company. One of the arguments we made to the federal government in the Amherst interview recently was on this point for trying to extend this to space exploration was that it could attract capital to come to Canada. And not really sure whether that's good or not. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Whether you could attract capital to yeah, Canada? If the laws were changed, say, to mm -hmm. make that people in Canada doing asteroid mining activities, and obviously almost all the work happens on the ground, so if we could get that to happen in Canada as opposed to in other countries, um, would it be, is there a way to try to tempt foreign capital to come and invest in Canadian ventures doing that sort of thing? I, I think you could. Using this mechanism. Yeah, I'm not really an expert on attracting foreign investment, so I think my comments with a grain of salt. But mm -hmm. I, I think they're looking for more than just invested capital. I think mm -hmm. they're looking for a stream of income in the future beyond just investing capital. So sure. if you look at the mining industry itself, you have a new mine, mm -hmm. you have all the communities that benefit from that, yeah. you have skills enhancement, and those skills can then be used elsewhere, mm -hmm. which goes beyond just the capital investment. Yeah, so there could be could local employment, the foreign capital, and local capital <coughs> go to pay Canadians to do asteroid mining stuff, engineering and stuff. And then in the distant, distant future, hopefully there would be profits flung back from the sky and, and some of that would be taxable. <laughs> right. That's the case you'd have to make, I guess. I think the thing they worry about mm -hmm. is that there are some very smart tax people mm -hmm. who would probably find a way <laughs> to uh, hive off that yeah. foreign you know, mm -hmm. income to make it not necessarily subject to tax, but maybe it's subject to tax in a lower tax jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. yeah, you yeah. know, some tax planning would probably happen, I suspect. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think that, it, whereas if you have a mine in Canada, mm -hmm. it's pretty hard to, you can't move the mine. Right. They, they've got it. Okay, thank you. So um, if we have a uh, <coughs> the uh, tax jurisdiction uh, and the um, geographic requirement being in the borders of Canada, for a mine specifically, it's for a resource site specifically, instead of trying to change the laws so that we can then use this uh, flow through share system to um, mine and harvest uh, celestial bodies, would it be easier to perhaps change for refining material? So if we built a permanent facility at a mine site or near a mine site 
and combined the refining of material uh, alongside <coughs> the terrestrial mining operations. And instead of trying to overturn the laws and extend it in a revolutionary way, we undertake an incremental expansion. Because now what you have is uh, refining activity. Uh, as long as then, at whatever cost, that material has to be returned and refined um, uh, at that location. Now, the, the only challenge is, I don't necessarily believe that for decades we have any kind of terrestrial model for build, bringing back material back to the Earth's surface um, at, with viable market economics. But irrespective of that, would an incremental development be easier to execute? You would have to overcome the CRA's or the government's policy, finances policy of um, the things that they don't mind you renouncing are intangible costs. Drill holes are intangible costs. They are not, there's nothing capital that I'm acquiring, I'm going out doing drilling, and those are intangible costs. There is a specific exclusion from being able to renounce the cost of a capital asset. So if I build a mill beside a mine, I cannot renounce those costs. They're, they're, they're really meant to be um, the, and once you start, it kind of gets to the point of once you start getting close to that uh, development, you're, you're, if you're building that, you're going to be close to profitable. You're going to get closer to being profitable than you would be at the very beginning of a project. You don't know much about space mining. No. <laughs> if you're building a plant that is going to be doing refining, I usually you've got some something going on. I hope. Um, but I think you'll have to overcome first of all the Department of Finance's policy that they do not renounce. Uh, you, they don't allow you to renounce capital asset costs because sometimes in a mine they can be your biggest cost, the mill or the refinery. One question. So. Given the, the insurmountable challenge of changing the CRA and the law, <laughs> what's the next best regime, program, share structure to look at to get this going on? I, I think later on the day we'll, we'll discuss uh, whether or not changing tax laws is an insurmountable achievement. Okay, uh, I believe here that the most important thing to take away from this presentation is the way the universe is now. The only way to change the universe is to understand exactly how it is now. Because then you can put the pressure in the right area. For all it's worth, one of the things we argued in front of Emerson, and I believe Kieran brought this up, was that there is an awful lot of overlap between the mining industry and the space industry. There's a long lead time before there's a return on investment. There's high upfront cost. And quite frankly, seven, eight, nine out of 10 of everything you do ends up as a hole in the ground. And we had a certain <laughs> amount of traction on that. So given the, the first wave of, of planetary mining companies has set themselves up and opted not to establish in Canada, uh, and knowing that there's a long lead time on changing tax law, what do we use to attract that startup here? Because I would say that the lead time for the typical mines I'm aware of are, 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 are 5 and 10, 15 years out. Uh, for all it's worth, the lead time for political activism is simply the next election. I, um, and with that, I'd like to return the, 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 the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Can I? I'll take another easy question. Well, it, it, it's not a question. It's something that, that I, I just thought people should be aware of. Um, <laughs> it sounds like a very difficult process to, uh, to change the, uh, the law and the government's view. Just patience, patience. Well, Always. in fact, the first step of that has already occurred. This is the uh, Emerson Report, the Aerospace Review. And I'm just reading one of the recommendations extending the favorable tax treatment currently afforded to investors in flow-through shares of mineral exploration companies to investors in commercial activity in space, whether or not that activity is mining. So the first step of the political process is on paper. And that's why he's president. <laughs> so the good news is someone has recommended it in a government report. 
I think it just takes a lot of patience and demonstrating the value that the government will get mm -hmm. and the taxpayers will get as a result of those investments. Uh, but easy question. Um, okay. I was wondering if R&D activities dedicated to mining, let's just say drilling technology or prospecting technology specific again for mining, would that be open to flow through shares? Not unless, it, so R&D is not open to flow through shares. The drilling part is. So to the extent you can argue that it is Canadian exploration expenditures, and there's a very specific definition, then yes, to the extent that you are doing research and development, 